All right. Is this a week to regroup or are we going to continue to wring our hands over this? The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. You know, it feels like it's going to be almost a long run right to January 10th when the inauguration actually happens. There's a lot of protests going on out there. And I have to tell you, I don't have my panties in a bundle over any of these protests. Um, people have the right to exercise their First Amendment speech, you know, rights. Is that redundant? That's what happens when you don't use a script. But it just, it's not something that we ought to be so upset over, we being those who won. You know, there's a, there's a lack of empathy that has been uh, seeping into our democracy, I think, for quite some time. And maybe this is the flush out. I hope it is. I hope it's not the start of something even more raw. But uh, one of the, uh, the folks who's been active in the protests here in the community is a guest of mine tonight. We're going to hear what he has to say about this and offer you some different points of view. And don't worry, for those of you who are just spiking the ball in the end zone over Donald Trump, you'll have... Plenty of voice here as we go. Let's go to the rundown on this Monday night. And thank you, by the way, for tuning in. Yeah, so this is a really interesting juxtaposition between the ultimate insider and somebody who could set the world on fire. Headlines, uh, backlash over Steve Bannon, the guy on the right, being made a senior advisor and chief strategist for Donald Trump. I'm not exactly sure what that means. We'll see as it goes. Other headlines. Uh, talk about Wright's Priebus in, in this role. Now, he's the DNC chair and a pretty, you know, a pretty sophisticated navigator of the entire complexity of the Republican primary season. Here's the latest from CBS. President-elect Donald Trump tells 60 Minutes' Leslie Stahl that his campaign pledges were starting points for negotiations, including the wall along the U.S.-Mexico border. Would you accept defense? Uh, for certain areas, I would, but certain areas, the wall is more appropriate. I'm very good at this. It's called construction. But that doesn't mean he's going soft on immigration. The people that are criminal and have criminal records, gang members, drug dealers, we have a lot of these people, probably two million, it could even be three million. We're getting them out of our country or we're going to incarcerate. It's an idea that has some support in Congress. If somebody has broken a major felony, do you still want them inside the country when they broke the law to come in in the first place? Running the White House for President-elect Trump will be Wright's Priebus. Mr. Trump has selected the RNC chairman to be his new chief of staff. Priebus is considered the ultimate Washington insider with close ties to congressional leaders, including House Speaker Paul Ryan. Mr. Trump also tapped Stephen Bannon as his White House chief strategist and senior counselor. The former CEO of Breitbart News was criticized for using the website as a platform for the alt-right movement, which has been linked to white nationalism. I've never met the guy. I don't know Steve Bannon, so I have no concerns. I, I, believe, I trust Donald's judgment. I think he's going to pick who he thinks will best serve him. As for the nationwide protests against him, Mr. Trump says Americans shouldn't be afraid of his administration and that he plans to bring the country together. Well, I'll talk more about the protests and the nature of it coming up here momentarily. That the uh, Speaker of the House doesn't know Steve Bannon, which then relieves him of worry, is just a stupid thing to say. I mean, it, First of all, the House Speaker should be getting to know Steve Bannon, should be promising to get to know Steve Bannon, and, and shouldn't discard it as some kind of throwaway appointment. It's a very provocative appointment. He and Reince Priebus, by the way, meaning the Speaker, are very close. My guess is, is that this isn't going to last very long. I, I don't see Reince Priebus and Steve Bannon uh, arguing for equity in the Oval Office for too very long a period of time. And as Donald Trump morphs into the system that he so promises to bust up, my guess is he will move much toward the system than the alt-right worries that everybody else has out there, um, from my lips to God's ears, right? Uh, speaking of God's ears and melodies that make you feel like you're speaking to him, Leonard Cohen passed away on November 7th, and uh, I guess in a double tribute, sort of, SNL did something uh, pretty provocative. You know, they have been just ripping Donald Trump in opening skits and the whole Kate McKinnon uh, uh, Hillary Clinton impersonation has really caught on, no doubt. They left the Donald Trump impersonation out of the opening skit and sung to everybody. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
I'm not giving up, and neither should you. And live from New York, it's Saturday night. You know, it's interesting. I couldn't tell if she was actually getting emotional during that whole thing. I think, I think she was, in a way, meaning Kate McKinnon. Um, I thought it was a really interesting and compelling touch. I think SNL has a history for all the decades of making us think. Um, and it was probably right in the wheelhouse where everybody surprisingly felt good about, uh, about what they did. Of course, they did a Trump election night skit right after that was hilarious as the election results were kind of uh, just ripping away from Hillary Clinton, you know, the 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock time uh, line type of skit is very funny, and David Chappelle was just, um, well, him. It was something. All right, allures of protection here. This is, uh, this is interesting. I think this is more of a hedged bet than anything you should be worrying about. A mayor resists Trump uh, in the headline here. Uh, he won't sacrifice any of our people. Uh, no immigration change in terms of how the city is approaching the conversation. Uh, as we move along through some of these other headlines, and I guess we've got a third one here which um, uh, leads us to the conversation that we'll have here this, this evening. And we'll continue enforcing our current policy to ensure that law-abiding residents can do just that, regardless of inconsequential civil infractions. In Providence, we're truly stronger than when we're together, and I'll work to protect every resident who feels uncertain of our nation's future. Uh, that is the, uh, the statement from Mayor Lorza. Uh, I don't think Donald Trump's going to be the problem that everybody thinks he's going to be in this. You know, criminals are one issue, but coming in for deportation of an 11, another, what, 8, 9, 10, 11 million people on civil infractions, it's not going to happen. So I told you it wasn't going to happen in the beginning. I promise you it's not going to happen in his presidency. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about the protests. Headlines on these protests galore, nationally, locally, more locally, I guess. My guest is here to, to talk about it. Um, George Evans Marley is a community activist, communications development director for HIV AIDS services, and we welcome you to the broadcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, what's your gut check? I think we need to always be prepared for the worst. Um, I think that that is on the forefront of everyone's mind right now, is uh, uh, everyone's concerned about the future right now. Uh, it's in a very uh, un uh, uncharted territory, I would have to, I'd have to say. Um, I was at the protests. Um, I had uh, really positive experiences there being with um, uh, all of uh, the citizens of Rhode Island who came together and uh, very loudly voiced their opinion. Uh, and it was so, I was so proud to see so many people there um, taking advantage of their right to protest and taking advantage of, of, of that ability uh, and, and really speaking peacefully as to what the concerns were in the community uh, and, and what steps we're looking to take going forward. Like what? Uh, organizing as best as possible, making sure that the uh, that everyone's rights are still being met. Um, I work with a, a, a great deal of human service uh, uh, industries uh, and a great deal of service providers, um, and everyone's top concern seems to be making sure that they have adequate health care. Um, there's a concern now that people will not have access to adequate health care uh, under under the new presidency. Um, so that's something that everyone has on the forefront of their mind. They want to make sure that they're all safe, they have adequate health care, um, and I'm sure you can agree that that's a big important thing. Yeah, I, I, I never thought that, I, I, again, uh, you know, I predicted during this campaign, by the way, I'm not a Trump guy, and the regular viewers know that I'm not a Trump guy. Uh, I, I was in the never Trump category. Uh, I was as shocked and uh, out of breath as anybody as election night came through. But you, you've got to put some things in perspective. Uh, the bluster of this campaign, and much of it is bluster, it seems to me. He's already slightly walking back his immigration policy. He's already talking about the A word, amendments of Obamacare, uh, as opposed to uh, replace and repeal. And he's trying to mumble through that there's no distinction between those two things right now. So, um, you know, the idea that folks can st kids can stay on their uh, family's plan until 25, 26 years of age and that pre-existing conditions will be part of his new change, those are two elemental guarantees in Obamacare that he's already conceding before he even gets down to opening up a book about it that he wants to keep around. So that's got to give you some kind of solace. Yeah, it, it, 
elementally, like, yes, at the beginning. Um, we, uh, we're not really sure what to expect, though. This is, this is a wild card, as far as I'm concerned. Um, this, uh, you know, w we have kids right now who are, are talking to their teachers and to their parents and to their counselors, saying that they're scared, that they're, uh, that, uh, you know, their family's going to be broken up, that they're going to be sent away. Um, and that's, uh, that's a concern to me, and that's a concern to so many of as well. Well, this whole fear thing is something interesting. We'll take a break here. We'll come back. We'll talk about this fear thing across the board, including Sheldon Whitehouse's letter last week, which was, what was that? Stay with us. So the nature of the protests here locally look like this. Not my president. Emotions out, signs up. On the steps of the State House Wednesday, locals voiced their message, saying America was already great and this country has no room for hate. We need to figure out what we can do here in Rhode Island on a local city and state level to protect the rights of people who are really vulnerable right now. Tarsus Martin considers herself one of those people. The Clinton supporter came to the United States from Brazil years ago. I'm a documented immigrant. I've been here since I was less than a year old. And even I'm frightened that if I try to apply for citizenship, something wonky is going to happen. As the rally turned protest, leaving the steps and filling the streets, Trump supporters stood by. Well, you're not uniting people, you're uniting people against the president-elect. Rob Barillo says people have the right to rally, but it's time to rally around their new leader. He said some outrageous stuff. I hope he tones down on that. He definitely needs to be a little more presidential. But I think that he will, and time will tell, that he will be one of the greatest presidents. Some for Trump, most for Clinton, and one for hope. Even though this is a very, very dark hour in my mind for democracy, there is always hope. The pendulum will only swing so far in one direction before it corrects. And while it seemed the march continued without a clear direction, the message of protesters was heard loud and clear. You think it's a dark hour? I think it's an hour for change. I think it is uh, an opportunity to seize uh, what is out there and to make the most of it. Uh, it it's an uncertain hour, if nothing more than that. Uh, the feeling in the community is that it's a dark hour, uh, again, because people's civil rights are in jeopardy um, based upon what, uh, what was put out there. That uh, I can absolutely agree with anybody who says it's a dark hour, for sure. Well, okay, so you just kind of, you just... You just kind of wheeled your back yourself back into the darkness there. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, look, I know it's, this is look. It, it's it's a historic election. There's no doubt about that, and it's it, it feels different because we've never seen come, somebody come out with the dynamics that Donald Trump presented and with the behavior that he exhibited. And anybody that denies that is just is is just on Pluto. But I'm trying to figure out what civil rights you're worried about. What civil rights will Donald Trump? threaten? Uh, well, going back to affordable health care, we, uh, you know, it was recently passed that affordable health care, it was a constitutional right that everyone should have affordable health care um, under the uh, Affordable Care Act. This is something... Well, that's legislation. That's not a constitutional amendment. That, okay. that, that's, the Affordable Care Act is legislation. So uh, um, it is is... It, it, it is as fluid and vulnerable as new legislation to be written, no doubt. Um, what else? Civil rights. I mean, you're obviously you're a health care guy. I mean, you, you've been working in HIV and AIDS for, for, for quite some time. And uh, by the way, how's that going? How's that work going? Uh, it's, it's very good. Uh, there, I mean, as, as good as that can possibly be. Um, there are some concerns right now with the... Um, uh, with legislative grants, um, ours was not renewed, um, right. so we're always uh, making sure that people are aware that our needle exchange is, uh, is in need of funding right now, um, our, uh, and, our, and all of our programs are. You know, I have to tell you something. You, you, you got more ground with me in arguing against your legislative grant being played around with <laughs> than you do when you get worried about Donald Trump, and I'll tell you why. Your legislative grant ended up becoming the victim of Eight legislators' bad behavior, which we see no direct tie to the actual legislative. Be In other words, he's jammed up State Representative Ray Gallison for things that seemingly have nothing to do with his legislative role, and the pressure that people like me have been putting on the State House for the the uh, what I call the rub and tug. Sorry, 
the legislative grants that are all 500 to a couple thousand dollars, the, mm -hmm. the, the couple, of fa couple of million dollars that feed the trough for legislators that I think is just really bad business. The six-figure type legislative grants that your agency you know, loses in all of this are all things that the constituents would have no quarrel with funding, right. none whatsoever. So you guys got to get smart about how you fight these things um, because you talk about a swing and a miss and hitting the wrong target. You guys are almost like the victims of a political drive-by. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's how it felt, yes. Uh, so you and I agree on that. I would have to agree, yes. Uh, so I, our, our, our needle exchange program, and it's, we're a little off topic right now, and I apologize. God, uh, in the old days, I used to fight needle exchange programs tooth and nail about what a waste of taxpayer money and the philosophy. And now I'm thinking, you know what? As you grow older, you start to think... Uh, health and welfare of people is much more important than politics. It is. It, it is our number one concern. As an agency, that's our number one concern. Um, we and as 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 a state and as a country, that should be our number one concern as well. Um, so our needle exchange program has proven that it works. We're seeing the uh, reduction, or we're seeing the number of uh, new infections in H, uh, in um, IV drug users uh, at at a zero to like 0.1 percent rate in new infections uh, from uh, IV drug users because of our needle exchange program. So it's a program that works, it's a program that's effective, and it's proven to be both effective and work. Um, it's kind of like a retro controversy. Uh, listen, you're working it every day, and I yeah. admire you for your work and your commitment to it. But it feels, on a political level, it's kind of like, um, I don't know, it's, it's like a mullet from the 80s. You know, it's, it's kind of like, like Monica Lewinsky. It's, we used to argue about this back then. Right now, let's just get people taken care of. Right. My guess is that you'll get refunded. Um, and you know what? My commitment to you for just showing up and talking about some of the politics is that we'll, uh, we'll spend some more time on that uh, in an ensuing show. But when we come right. back, we're going to get back to this notion that Donald Trump is not somebody's president. Stay with us. All right, so, you know, more of this, and I, again, as I said at the top of the show, I don't get my panties in a bundle over this. I really don't. This is, this is what America stands for. You're allowed to stand up. What I don't understand, though, like, well, look, I'm not going to say I don't understand it. What, I, what, I, what I'm, I'm losing patience on already, though, is this notion that Donald Trump is not my president, which is something that you hear a lot at these events, nationally, locally. Uh, what is your take on that? Uh, he is the president-elect. That's my take on that. <laughs> he has been voted in as our president, uh, and it's uh, it's something that again came to a shock for many, or came as a shock for many people on election night. Um, and when it comes down to it, he is our president. So, did you uh, you hear that kind of language when you're out at these protests? Do you do you confront that? Is there is there a good intra protest community debate going on? There is a lot of talk about what we can do with this, um, with the current administration, or what the current administration will be, um, how um, how best to counteract any uh, any legislation that he might put forward that would jeopardize the uh, the, uh, the Americans' human American human rights. Um, with the um, with a specific chance and with, uh, I mean, it's a lot, there's a lot of frustration and there's a lot of passion um, that, that we're seeing at these protests. And the ones in Rhode Island have been peaceful. They've been very well thought out. It's about organizing. It's about getting people out and showing their support. Um, the, and, and I live on Facebook. Uh, if anybody knows me, I, I share and react to anything that happens out there. Um, and the youth, the use of social media right now in this in this election, going uh, prior to the election and now after the election, has been a um, has really been a huge um, uh, a, a huge rallying point for people um, to come together uh, in uh, in protest. I, when I hear, I live on Facebook. <laughs> Don't actually live I, on Facebook. I, I cringe. <laughs> Listen, I get the power of social media. Look, we got a social media war going on here. Donald Trump can't stop tweeting. Right. Yeah, you know, New York Times uh, got the brunt of his tweets three times yesterday. He can't. He can't help himself. Uh, someone's going to have to take his phone and smash it as the president of the United States. Uh, look, the Pope tweets. The president can tweet, but he's going to have to temper his tweeting behavior. It seems to me. Uh, but Facebook is interesting, um, George, because 
It, it seems to me that it's hard to determine the chicken or the egg, and that is, does the uh, means of communication uh, facilitate point of view or create it and change it? I would submit that it's more the latter than the former. I think it all depends on how you how one perceives uh, each individual post or tweet or or Instagram picture. It's all it's about It's easy to be a keyboard coward. Oh, absolutely. It's easy to rant from your keyboard. It can be a hurtful, destructive uh, means of of uh, attack. It also could be an organizing skill set. Uh, and the fine line is significant. Don't you think? I agree. Uh, the the protests that happened uh, last week, uh, they were organized via Facebook. That's you know people got together, they uh, they found common ground, and they were able to make that happen. Um, there are a lot of people who um, uh, who who use social media at. at as um, as a shield, they can put a lot of information out there and not actually have to show up. Um, but as we're seeing in a lot of these protests, that people are actually showing up to them and they're being vocal and they're um, and and they're using they're using their power to protest to to show that they're concerned. Hmm. Without Facebook, though, they might have to work on what they have to say. <laughs> no, because yeah. the, because our communication skills are are dwindling right in front of our very eyes. Even those who are angry. They don't articulate very well why they're angry. It's a conversation for another day. So your visit causes us to say, well, that's a call. That's, not, that's a conversation for another day. That's a conversation for another day. That's Sorry. a conversation for another I've day. I've opened up a lot of can of worms. Well, no, it's, it's, it's um, look, look, at, at the end of the day, uh, as I said, I'd like to see people relax about protesters. Protesting is an American cultural given. Uh, We'll just see how long it lasts. I mean, there's a mourning process. Any projection as to how long the mourning process will last versus the activism when things come up legislatively? Those are very different concepts. Um, I would be surprised to see uh, it not immediately happen after after the inaug like after the inauguration. I feel like there's going to be. We're going to see a lot of hand wringing between now and then, at least. You're saying. Uh, at least, um, and uh, you know. I think the grief process is normal. I think that the, this mourning process um, uh, is uh, is a huge part of of our country's history right now, and I look forward to seeing what happens afterwards. All right, man. Appreciate uh, you coming in. Thank you. All right. Final word. We're not done. We did have a major loss last night. Fourth and what at the what? Well, stay with us. That just goes to show you that even the Patriots with Tom Brady can have an off night. Poor Kevin's been directing the program and weary from a Sunday night episode. We have anything on it? Ah, Gronk couldn't pull that one in. Well, he was interfered with. Whatever. Listen, uh, they can lose and you can survive. Some of you out there are probably having a worse time now than you did with the election. And if you want to just you know, have something to, to wide-eyed wonder about, make sure you check out the moon tonight. When I was driving out of my neighborhood early last evening and saw that moon, I literally drove back. My wife was in the house and, and said, uh, hey, listen, get in the car. You've got to see this. It was spectacular. And I guess it's going to be even more spectacular this evening. In fact, as you're watching the program now, when it's over in 10 seconds, so take a look at the moon. It's a wonder of the world. Good night.